I'm not dead. That sounds like something interesting. We're here with Katrina Setzer from River Road Park and Recreation District. You just sent me into the water aerobics class, and I gotta tell you people, my wife used to teach here and teach that class. I've never taken water aerobics, and I swim, and I thought that was gonna be a breeze. It's hard. It was really hard. Yep. I mean, my thighs it's are- It's a workout. Hitting. It's a workout. He's gonna feel it tomorrow. So tell me, what, what is River Road Park and Recreation District? We do everything. We're all about community and getting people together and learning, staying fit, uh, meeting people, making friends and connections is what it's all about. You really have made the River Road area its own neighborhood. It always has been, but you've really hit kind of with the park district helped to keep it that way. That's the whole goal. We have a beautiful nine acre park here and um, incredible instructors and incredible people. Both legs, kicking both legs at the same time. And classes, what kind of classes? Give me just a, a, a variety. We do so many classes that I can't mention them all, but um, lots of fitness classes starting on the pool side as well as Zumba, um, dance classes, um, lots of different types of fitness classes. And then we do art classes, language classes, um, computer classes, so lots of different things. So different age groups, different people, yes. and it's all about getting people to know that there's a, it, it's almost like what the school used to be in a neighborhood, mm -hmm. is this is where people congregate. It is, and we and we really do, um, we cater to all different ages. So we do lots of different youth programs, and then tons of different things for adults of all ages. Now tell me a little bit about the park itself. I don't think there's a person in this area who hasn't been to Emerald Park who doesn't go, that is the best park in town. It is the best park in town. It's beautiful. It's a nine acre, lush, green, lots of trees, um, a great place to have a summer picnic. But reserve early. Reserve early, yes. Yeah, it, they do, um, they book. One of the things I know you're really known for out here is your day tripping. Yeah. Day tripping and I'm leaving with you. Day tripping. Tell me about the day trips. Day trips are one of my favorite things that we do here. Um, we go local and try different restaurants. Um, and then we go up to Portland, we go over to the coast. We do lots of um, different things to get people out exploring and meeting other people that like to travel because not only do we do day trips, we do extended travel. To all over the world. All over the world, yeah. Why is that so important in a park district like this, do you? Think. I think that it's really important for people to make connections and I keep going back to that but um, if you love travel and you love doing things then you want to meet other people that love doing things and love travel so my goal and my purpose I feel like is to make uh, those help people make those connections so that if you want to go to China then you'll be able to meet other people that enjoy traveling in that capacity and as a neighborhood that's a really fun way to do it absolutely it? yes right. yeah Credibility is huge. I mean, it's you put the facts together and you tell the story, the complete picture, then that builds your credibility. Trust is um, key because if they don't trust what it is that you're doing every single week, then they're not going to subscribe the paper. They're not going to buy the paper. They're going to look for other sources to find the news that they want. And the best way to stay informed is pick up the paper, and if it's not in the paper, let us know that it's not in the paper so we can go find who we need to to get that story. It is about them. It's about the community. That's what the paper is. It's the community paper for Cottage Grove. Are you ready? Yeah. Here we go. Do a little pencil spring toss with this here. We'll get our pan nice and hot. Move all of them. Get that all spread around nice and even on the bottom of the pan. 
I almost want to bring it to smoke point where you can only see that's starting to want to smoke. It's nice and hot and you get a good sear on your vegetables. I'm going to go ahead and dump my pasta right in here so she's ready to go. Right here, nice and warm. So we'll get some garlic roasting up real nice. Get it bloomed a little bit. I mean, get the flavors going. We're gonna add our squash. Turn the heat down just a little bit. You don't want to burn the garlic, but you do want to get a little brown. Adds a lot of flavor to the dish. Next, we'll add some pesto. Toss it all up nicely. We're gonna bring the heat back up. Our tri-colored penne. Some fresh spinach, local. Over here, I just like to stick some nice fresh herbs and tomatoes up to the side. And we're going to take some nice fresh burrata. Burrata is a very soft. Uh, double cream mozzarella. Your mouth, but also you eat with your eyes and your nose. Everything must look appealing and fresh. So here we have a nice fresh pesto pasta, and that's what's cooking from the water for Graham. Now we're here with Gail Doyle Auroran, a teacher at the Campbell Center, and she teaches memoir writing, which I'm sorry, that just gets me right in there, right, 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 right off the bat right there. Yeah. So tell me about writing me our memoirs and why that's healthy. Well, it's just so important to get on paper. I mean, people like me, our grandparents didn't do that. And it's just so sad not to know more about their lives. And particularly since I lived in Hawaii and they lived in Kansas. And in those days, people didn't travel much. But it's just important to get what you've done in your life on paper so that your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren will know more about and life. Now, you guys wrote a book as, yes. as a class. Go ahead and tell me about that. Okay. It, it's called Our Memoir Collection, Everybody Has a Story. And that is so true. And it's just little brief things from all the students that were in that particular class. And we got it published and we done a book signing and done lots of things. But it just... And, Everybody just, all the students just loved it and had a great time passing it on to their families. And many of the people are writing their stories for their family. But today, the memoir seems to be the novel of the 21st century. And everybody's writing memoirs. There are lots of people, famous people and not so famous. But it's amazing how many of these students have stories that I have said, you need to try and get a publisher to get this published for more than just your family. So when we're talking, you said this is almost like therapy for people when they sit down at you know, 70, 80, 90 and start writing these things down. Why is that? I think it's because it brings back up what has happened in their life and sometimes really difficult situations that they've had, whether parents died very young or divorced or something like that, and how they had to deal with these difficult situations. And to put it on paper, it's almost like letting it go. And it just has made such a difference. I'm getting goosebumps just even talking too, about actually, it. Yeah. It's just absolutely amazing and everybody seems to enjoy it. Several of the students have taken the class all five years and they just keep coming back because they keep having more to write about and uh, just really enjoying it. Gail, so. does it give, does it solidify or almost make it more real when we put something on paper? Yes, definitely. And several of my students have had their books published and their families have been just so delighted and um, 
it just it really does make it more real not only for you the writer but also for your family our friends and let me ask you this too why is it why is it important as we age um, to do it our own way it's just this is your truth I mean it's funny we've had sometimes um, people that their sister has read what they wrote and they said well that's not the way I remember it at all but this is your story and your version of what happened and some of them have even said that they're glad their parents have died because they didn't want their parents to read it but and some of them have I mean Again, life has changed so much. I know that there's one student who uh, married a black man. She's white, and she married a black man way back when, and her family disowned her. And she moved to another area and raised her family and her children that are half black and had a wonderful life. But it was very difficult to have something like that happen in your life. So, so is it important as we... Uh, I just in life, actually, to, to be around people in community. Oh, definitely. And that's another thing that Campbell Commu Senior Center gives people the opportunity to do that and take classes like this and other classes, too. So. Do you think people, when they're together writing like that, it's so personal that you are really, you're, you're finding a family there? Oh, amen. That is definitely true. And uh, we have, many of us, become very close and uh, I certainly do feel like it's my family I just love it and I keep teaching because I enjoy it I mean I'm old enough that I could stay home and do nothing but uh, I just really thoroughly enjoy it and it's so interesting too because my husband and his mother-in-law from his wife who passed away from cancer have been taking the class every single time too so I mean it really is family <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being with us. I appreciate it. Oh, and people can sign wonderful. up at the Camel Center to take your class. Yes, very definitely. But look yeah. out, it's therapy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to learn things about but yourself. it's cheap therapy. Because <laughs> <laughs> the class doesn't cost that much. Thanks, so. Gail. Thank you. I'm a pioneer to my own life. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. 65-year-old Ken Darling looks a little out of place walking the streets of Eugene, Oregon. And I've got a lot of help uh, by having, a, having the heritage I do. Actually, much of this town once belonged to his family. Uh, my mother was a Skinner, her father was a Skinner, his father was a Skinner, and then Eugene Franklin Skinner. Ken is the great-great-grandson of Eugene Franklin Skinner, founder of Eugene, Oregon. Little tiny kid, you know, I mean, hearing from Grandpa all the stories, you know, that he had. Ken grew up in Portland, but remembers visiting the Skinner family in Eugene as a little boy. It's, it, it's with me all the time. You know, and if you're standing in front of the library, probably every other day, you'll see me pass by the Jim Carpenter sculpture of my great-great-grandfather and positioning myself exactly the way my great-great-grandfather was. Is some resemblance you know, for whatever it's worth. Eugene Skinner settled along the river near the Butte that bears his name in 1847. How amazing I'm sure uh, people thought it was that oh the government's gonna give me 640 acres I have to stay on the land for four years I have to be married and I have to have a house. I walked this land. This is what 640 acres looks like from south of 8th all the way to the river, including the Butte. Grandpa, where's my piece of property? 
Later, Eugene Skinner donated 40 acres to help create the county seat that became the town of Eugene City. Ken recently found his way back to Eugene looking for the same thing his great-great-grandfather was looking for, a new start. Um, I got caught up in the crash, uh, financial crash, so basically my career was gone. Ken, like his great-great-grandfather Eugene, is not sure what the future might hold, but he thinks this may be the best place to start looking. You know, I know struggle as well, uh, and so it is exciting to study my family and see what kind of struggles they went through. Just shores me up to, um, uh, to do what's necessary. It makes you wonder, what would Eugene Skinner think of his little town today? I have a feeling he would probably be pretty scared. Only a few remnants of the time when Eugene Skinner was alive remain. There's his watch. The first clerk's office, tiny building, and he was the clerk for the county. I've been up to the gravesite at the Masonic Cemetery. History has a way of linking the present with the past, and maybe that's what Ken Darling is looking for, a connection to be shown something so touchable as far as a pioneer and what they had to go through, that it will say something to them and their lives. And, you know, well, if Eugene Franklin Skinner can do it, so can I. Uh, my name's Ken Darling, and Eugene Franklin Skinner was my great-great-grandfather. I feel like I'm home. Is everything here grand? I mean, you have a grand building, you have a grand fountain behind us. Well, of course, and it's the water for grand. <laughs> and a grand dining room. Okay, I'll tell you one place you can go that's grand, but it's off campus here. Mm. So you, it's Ranchito Grill in Springfield, and Abe and Ruben run this place, and every month Ranchito Grill and Rick Dancer TV give away two free dinners to somebody that goes in, signs their name, puts their phone number down, they do a drawing, and we give away a, two free dinners. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. It's just on the way to your brother's house. It's not that far. Okay. So we're going to put the name of the winner for this month right here on the screen. Well, it might be here, but it's okay. around this direction. So get in there, sign up. You could win two free dinners at Ranchito Grill. I sound so bossy when I do that. You do. I you like do. that about me. <laughs> yeah, you, you do need journalism because, you know, people, we live in an age where people have a lot of things going on and uh, there's a lot of different sources that are pulling away from their time schedules and so they rely on us to be places and cover things that they can't get to and it might be everything from a city council meeting with a hot topic uh, such as a sick leave or something like that and so uh, they depend on us to be there uh, when we're there all the time. New Horizons in home care we've been in business for actually 30 years and we're the largest independent in-home care agency in the state. We serve medically fragile children all the way up to 100 plus. So it can be anything from, you know, basic housekeeping all the way up to some type of medical need that that person might have. All of our care managers that oversee the caregivers, CNAs, are, are nurses, and those nurses provide that oversight. We always have a nurse on call all weekend, all night. We are seeing the individuals that we serve as people who are active, who still have lots of life left. They're not uh, someone that is thrown away. Sheep's in the meadow and the cows in the corn. 
With a little luck, we'll be right back. So please leave your name and number. Thank you. It's roundup time at the Glory Hill Ranch. But we've had a good grass here. Our steers look big and fat. We'll see what they weigh. Ranching is something Gloria Lopes has done most of her 67 years on this earth. Look at my cute grandkids. There's Wade, I've got Wyatt, I've got my son. It's a family thing. There's no hired help here, so it takes family and a few friends to round up the Lopes cattle. I was raised where you did things yourself, you know? And the best help you can get is at the end of your arm, you know? So Johnny and I manage to do everything ourselves, and that's what makes it nice. Raising cattle is not as easy as it used to be. Gloria has to take out a loan to pay for all of these animals. And when she sells them, they're not sold by the head, they're sold by the pound. So if several of the animals come in 50 pounds light, that can make a big difference in her profit margin. Now I'm going to get the results today. And then if the results look rewarding, then you turn right around. In fact, I've already started again buying more cattle, and you continue year after year. Part of not growing old is having something to do, never worrying about what you have to do, it's what you didn't get done. So you're just constantly, constantly uh, changing, moving, going on. Gloria Lopes might not fit some people's image of the average cattle rancher. But this woman says she's salt of the earth. She knows what she's doing, and she loves it. It's like you get a new beginning every year. I think that's probably the what makes people want to be in, in, the, in the business with livestock or farming. About a year ago, a lot of people in our community lost their hearing services. A big agency closed. You don't want to start over and you don't know where to turn. Grant's Hearing Centers will help you. I love being able to help people hear better. Yeah, that's the big thing. With your permission, Grant can access your files. Grant's Hearing Centers in Eugene and Cottage Grove. We put the hearing aids on, turn them on, and then they can actually, uh, it's just li like the light switch comes on. They can hear so well. Listening to you is our business. Call Grant's Hearing Center. Consumers depend on their cars on a daily basis. One indicates that the battery is well above what it needs to do. My goal is for you to trust me to make sure that your car is dependable. 45 years ago, service was real. You had people with hearts and they were looking at your car and they were passionate. Then as the world grew, I think service kind of got lost. We want to build a relationship with you so that not only you bring your car to me, but that you want to buy a car from me later. My job is to build that relationship with trust. And the only way to do that is to be honest, first of all, but secondly, is to be thorough and make sure that I'm doing everything I can to make sure that you and your car get you from point A to point B. It's a great way to build relationships. If you're looking for a barber who understands the art of cutting hair, Francesco Michelli is the man. This guy really knows what he's doing. He takes his time, he understands his customer, and he knows what makes you look good. They even do the little extras, like a straight razor shave to get those little hairs off of all those places. Yep, even the top of ears. I'm telling you, if you want a good haircut, somebody who knows what they're doing, a true artist, go to my barber, Fresh Cut, Francesco Michelli. He's the man. 541-357-6903. Joining us is Donna Peterson, a gerontologist with New Horizons, and we're going to talk about some really, I, I like this topic because I'm getting so close to it, I want to do this right. It, it's really basically how to age right, how to do this well. Exactly. 
successful aging model was designed, um, it was funded by the MacArthur Foundation through uh, a proposal with Dr. Rowan Kahn back in the 90s. And it was a 10-year research project that was interdisciplinary. So they wanted to look at what it means to age positively, positively in such a way that individuals would know what was the best way to move forward in their living, actually. So rather than just letting it happen, to have right. a plan, to really look at Correct. things and like, like we do with every other, other aspect of our life, how am I going to go into this new stage of my life with some momentum Correct. and do it well? So what are those four stages? Active engagement with life is one that people need to continue no matter what age they're at with interaction with individuals. A lot of people, what they do is they retire and then they sit back and they don't interact. Well, we know that that's good for your body, your brain, and also um, there's a lot of things that people do uh, with active engagement like volunteering. We rely on our aging population for the, the volunteerism. So staying connected to community. And staying connected. Uh, the other one, avoidance of disease, would be those, in, it doesn't mean that you don't have diabetes or something along that, along that line, but what it does mean is, like if you're smoking, you quit smoking. If you haven't exercised, you start exercising. Uh, maybe you haven't eaten right. You eat, you look at that differently and you eat nutritionally like the Mediterranean diet. The other one would be lifelong learning. And lifelong learning, we hear about that all the time now. And it all came out of this study. We know that if people learn new things as they age, they have better cognition, they're able to uh, interact better. So it's very, very important to learn new things. And it doesn't mean that you have to learn a concert, you don't have to be a concert pianist. And positive spirituality means you combine religion, which is a belief system in one particular belief and and the other is spirituality, where you look at life that, as if there's something greater than you and learning how to interact with your life and the life around you in a very non-biased, non-discriminatory way through looking at, and it doesn't have uh, an impact on race, ethnicity, any of those kinds of things that um, you are more advanced that way. So those combination would be what they consider positive spirituality. I'm not dead. That sounds like something interesting.